What I'd like to do tonight is just to offer some thoughts and some observations because the project that we're working on will last into the late summer and we'll be producing a report uh, that will come out in the, in the early fall. Uh, but the, a couple of observations uh, to spring off of what you saw uh, in that the past year has been the least uh, iced Arctic uh, in recorded history, but at the same time, it has been the stormiest Arctic um, in recorded history. Uh, the Arctic and the Antarctic are very different, and the simple way that I like to describe them is that the Antarctic is land surrounded by water, and the Arctic is water surrounded by land. And with that opening of the ocean, I refer to that as the most significant event that's happened since the end of the last ice age. And for people that either wear navy blue or coast guard uh, blue, uh, when there's more water, we tend to get really excited about that. And so we, uh, uh, but we, we really need to pay, uh, pay close attention to it. Um, when I think about the Arctic and how we're looking at the Arctic uh, at, at Hoover, is you really can look at it in four ways. And, and they're really quite simple. For me, uh, you have to look at the Arctic from the standpoint of what are the resources that are going to be up there and that people will seek. The other is what about the environment? What is happening to this very pristine spot on the earth uh, that really has not been affected uh, by humans uh, over time? Uh, and then the other aspect is the indigenous population that exists in the Arctic. And then what about the security? And by security, uh, our view and what we're working on at Hoover is not the military dimension exclusively, but what must be in place in this area that's opening up in an unprecedented way to ensure a safe, secure, and prosperous region of the world. When people talk about the resources in the Arctic, it's very easy to conjure up the image of drilling rigs and all of the activity that goes on to extract energy uh, from the earth, whether it's oil or gas. But there's a lot more uh, in the way of resources in the Arctic. The largest zinc mine in the world is in Alaska the Red Dog Mine. In Siberia, there are large nickel and copper mines. In Canada, a huge iron ore mine on Baffin Island. And in southwest Greenland, there's estimated to be one billion tons of iron ore. And, and this is not just speculation because the Chinese have seen fit uh, to invest $2.3 billion in southwest Greenland to go after that ore. So those, when we talk about resources, it's pretty significant. And that doesn't account for the resources that are on the seabeds. Uh, that, too, will be of value to individuals. And then when you look at the estimates on the undiscovered energy resources, 30 percent of the undiscovered gas is estimated to be in the Arctic and 13 percent of the undiscovered oil is to be in the Arctic. And so what about the environmental issues once you move away from the resources? Because people will be coming for the resources. They already are. Um, and so what are some of the, the environmental considerations that come into play? It's still a very, very harsh place. Uh, as I said, the stormiest year in recorded history. Dark most of the time. Um, the ability to move and respond to events in the Arctic. The infrastructure, quite frankly, is not there. And Admiral Zuckumpf has led some exercises there to, to test and to, and to try to determine how we as a country will respond to events that take place. The shoreline, as a result of the climate change that's taking place, uh, is changing dramatically the ice is breaking off from the shore. In some cases, the ice is crushing into the shore as it moves around. 
uh, the permafrost is melting and heaving up the earth. So the structures, if there are any there, are, are being uh, damaged and in some cases destroyed. And as that permafrost is, is melting, you're releasing large quantities of methane gas into the air. The, there will be, as the, as the warming trend continues, uh, a movement north of vegetation and insects. And what will that do with regard to uh, disease vectors that may be carried um, uh, by those insects? Uh, so there are a lot of environmental considerations that, that are going to come into play. And how do we respond to those? And what's the best way to respond to them? When we looked at indigenous populations in the Arctic, um, their way of life is gone forever. A way of life that for millennia they have lived as, as a subsistence culture of hunting and sealing and fishing and whaling. Uh, their communities will no longer be in positions to be able to do that. Um, they are being influenced in a way uh, by the internet that pulls them away from their traditional beliefs and values and ways of life and that subsistence culture. So that's having a change. Uh, four million people live in the Arctic and that four million is beginning to migrate a bit. Uh, during the Soviet Union and in, in, the, in the high north of the Soviet Union, there was forced settlement uh, and forced communities. Uh, as uh, the Soviet Union disappeared and there was more freedom, many of those people have moved. And a lot of the uh, uh, resource uh, industries that are, that are beginning to be developed in the Arctic, uh, third countries are starting to come into play. Large numbers of people from Central Asia, Poland, there's even a large Thai community uh, up in some of the areas working on some of the, the energy and the, uh, and the resource uh, issues. And it's that population that also distinguishes the Arctic from the Antarctic. Four million people live above the Arctic Circle. No one lives in the Arctic. A lot of penguins, but not people. Um, when we look at the security uh, requirements, a need to be able to support and respond and react to the events that are taking place. And when we look at security, as I've said, it's about safety, response for environmental or other accidents that could take place up there. And it's there that our Coast Guard is going to be on the front lines of anything that happens in the Arctic. Tourism, as I said, has taken off in 2013 in the Coast Guard's most recent strategic uh, uh, or Arctic strategy is forecasting uh, uh, over a million tourists in the Arctic next year. And during one of our workshops at Hoover, someone had a great picture of a large cruise, ships, cruise ship with thousands of people on it, weaving in and out of the icebergs up there. And then I immediately recalled the picture of the Costa Concordia laying on its side off the coast of Italy, uh, where those people could just jump into the water and swim ashore. Uh, what's going to happen in the Arctic where you don't have the infrastructure to go after them. And that's why the infrastructure piece in my mind is so, so very important to be able to do that. Question. The environmental community has been very negative towards any energy exploration in the Arctic. Example of Greenpeace campaign against Shell. Do you see any positive resources or impacts that the energy industry is bringing to the region? I think that the technology that is gone into uh, being able to um, extract the resources safely uh, has been extraordinary. I believe that the uh, support uh, that the companies that have been up there have put into the operations have been um, uh, quite extraordinary. And you look at the amount of money that they have paid uh, or that they have spent to conduct operations up there, it's, uh, it's extensive. And so I think that we will see um, a continued emphasis on the technology, continued emphasis on environmental responsibility and on safety. And I, I, I personally believe that, uh, uh, that it can be done in a responsible way. 
Sir, as your role as the Chief of Naval Operations, did you look at a different kind of Navy to deal with the Arctic than you have currently have today? Uh, there was no question that we would need um, different um, uh, types of ships to operate up there, but not great numbers of them, but they would have to be designed to be operated, uh, to operate in that environment. They'd have to be hardened, they'd have to be able to uh, not be as prone to ice accumulation. They'd have to be uh, ships that had very different ventilation systems in them because the, the ships that we operate today are really optimized toward the, the middle band, middle latitude bands. Um, and so that would have to happen. But I would also say that we were looking uh, intently at uh, unmanned systems, particularly unmanned underwater systems. Uh, because it's the, the, the beauty of an unmanned system is that it can do the dull and the dangerous and you don't have to risk a human being. And so I think that there are opportunities uh, for unmanned uh, technology to move forward um, and also uh, to be able to be employed in the scientific uh, uh, work and, and exploration that has to take place because, as I said, so much of the Arctic is not surveyed. So unmanned systems can do that uh, much more efficiently, I believe, uh, than manned systems can, uh, can do. And then there are also the communication architectures that need to be put in place. And you have to make decisions about, particularly for the Navy and the Coast Guard, which ones do you want to have total control over? What aspects of communication are you willing to ride on commercial systems? And so those were some of the things that we were looking at as we tried to decide how we were going to uh, invest our money in, in the Arctic future. They, you answered a good many of your questions in your presentation. Great. But I want to thank you so much for what you're doing on this project. It's very, very interesting, and I would like the audience to help me thank Admiral Gary Duffin. Thanks, Mike. Thank you. Thank you.